Um, welcome everyone. I call this meeting of the Governance Committee to order. Um, we'll start with a roll call. Uh, Councillor Tabor. Here. Councillor Lombardi. Here. And I'm Councillor Cook, and I am here. Um, normally we would review and approve the minutes from June 26th. Right now we don't have those in our packet, so we're going to hold off on that until our next meeting. Um, so sorry about having that on the agenda. I kind of hoped we'd have them, but we don't. Um, so we will pause and get back to that. Aspirational. Uh, yes. <laughs> so uh, we will start with um, old business this morning. And uh, so you all know I've placed the uh, ordinances for uh, blue ribbon conversions first because uh, I think that we have them back in generally final format for this mm -hmm. uh, committee to review. So this morning I wanted to start with the Economic Development Committee ordinance. Um, and I will turn over to Council Lombardi and let him lead us through this. Okay, well, I mean, there's only one change in that from the last review, um, if I'm not mistaken. I, um, and that had to do with the creation of a rotation of the, the, uh, the membership. And in the original version, um, what would happen is that um, in 26, there would be two. I open up a packet, of course, there's lots of copies of the same thing. Um, and in 29, there would be, there would, in, in 27, there would be no changes. In 29, there would be four changes. And in 30, there would be three. So the adjustment that came about with the EBC's recommendations, thank you, sir, um, are that in 28, there would be two. Um, in 27, there'd be two. 29, there'd be two. And 30, there'd be three. So that, that's what that adjustment does. It, 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 uh, and I got them a little bit out of order, but. Um, so that really corrects it. Okay. Um, and that, so that was the purpose of that change. And there was that detail. If you took the time to go through that detail, you could see that. Yes. Um, if anyone at home is asking about the detail, um, it's in the packet, but you'll see um, the information on terms that's listed in the packet. And um, what Council Lombardi is really describing is an effort to make sure that the terms um, uh, have are rotational um, and that we don't have everyone expiring at the same time. So that, that is the language change that's been added here, if I'm correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it was helpful to have the, uh, the comparison, mm -hmm. uh, which shows how the terms with this language change stagger evenly. Uh, so I think it makes sense. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And, well, and it also accommodates every year where otherwise before uh, 27 and 28 were just, there were no uh, new appointments, so. Uh, yeah. This is positive. So has everyone had a chance then to go through this in its final draft language? And is everyone comfortable with the rest of the draft, um, which we have reviewed before? Yes. Here at yes. Governance. Okay. Yeah, no, we've made some changes. So I, I would move that we send this now. I, I think we can send it directly to the council. Is that not right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, unanimously move forward. Um, we will put that on the... I will tee that up on the agenda for the council in 
August for the first meeting in August. I will request a review then for the first review, that second meeting in August for first reading. Okay. Um, the second item on our agenda, I'll go back to the agenda so everyone sees this, is the Arts and Cultural Commission ordinance. And as you will see here, um, I'm bringing us there. Um, this was the language that we sent off to Arts and Cultural Commission, several uh, a request to review. Um, Arts and Cultural Commission has been looking at this. This is a, a shift from their Blue Ribbon Committee to, um, to a permanent standing committee from Arts and Nonprofits to Arts and Cultural Commission. Um, the Arts and Cultural Commission has been meeting on this um, for um, now a few months, having these discussions, and they voted um, this last week to move this forward, and they wanted governance to take a quick look before it goes to the council. So um, with that, um, we have a guest this morning who I invited to speak to this. Um, I can also speak to this, um, but I, I wanted to make sure that our, our guest had an opportunity to answer your questions. Um, so uh, we've invited John Mayer to come. Please come forward. Uh, and John served with me on the subcommittee for the cultural plan um, uh, and the working group that specifically looked at language around a draft ordinance. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about process so that you're aware. The Arts and Nonprofits Committee has a subcommittee, the cultural planning subcommittee. And then in the cultural planning subcommittee, there are task forces. And those task force, forces reported back to the cultural plan subcommittee. Um, those task forces have been working on different things. The specific task force was working on an ordinance, a draft ordinance, and reviewing um, everything that was done by ArtSpeak when ArtSpeak existed. When they reported back to um, the Arts and Nonprofits Committee on the first occasion, the Arts and Nonprofits sent them back with recommended changes to the ordinance. Um, the committee then, the, sub, the task force then looked at recommended changes, brought them back to the, a joint meeting of the Cultural Planning Subcommittee and the Arts and Nonprofits Committee. And at that meeting, um, they finalized this language and then moved it forward um, with a request that governance look at it um, to send it forward to the council. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, okay. I just, uh, just a clarification bef before you get started too, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, the, the language of the membership um, includes uh, four members shall represent arts and cultural institutions. Mm -hmm. So does that imply that they do not necessarily have to be s residents of Portsmouth? Um, the individuals would not have to be residents. The institutions because they're representing would. The, the institution. Yes, the institutions would have to be yeah. residents, and those institutions would be app appointed, not individuals. Yeah. So the institution would send their representative, and that representative would not necessarily be the same person. It would be an institutional representative. So we're to really talking about institutional membership in the mm -hmm. same way, like the Chamber of Commerce would have um, representation on the mm -hmm. EDC. I think that's good because the arts and culture of this area is broader than just Portsmouth. Okay, and um, John, would you Sorry. Like to add, no, go add ahead. a few things for right. well, where we are? Okay. Thank you, Kate. Thank it's you. been a pleasure to serve with Kate. I'm a member of the Cultural Planning Subcommittee, and as Kate mentioned, we broke the tasks of that subcommittee into different groups. So I worked with Kate on the review of what was called Art Speak. If you remember, Art Speak was a quasi-governmental body. It was a nonprofit, but it also served the city. But it sort of it it fell apart in a way. So um, when we started our work to review the 2002 cultural plan, it became very clear that one of our needs, or what the community needed, was what. Um, they call an implementing body, and some group that would have a degree of ownership over the cultural plan. 
and be able to play a role in helping advance whatever the goals were that were identified with that. Without ArtSpeak, Portsmouth doesn't have an implementing body like that. So this is an attempt as one of the primary responsibilities of the Arts Council would be to um, be the agency that sort of advances that work. But then other duties would be to coordinate in general activities related to arts and culture in the community. Um, so it's, there, there's a number of examples in New Hampshire that we can draw from. The New Hampshire State Council on the Arts coordinates a lot of activities of arts commissions that exist in different communities and every community is different. I think as a starting point, the scope of work for this arts commission is pretty general and, and pretty obvious, you know, in terms of needs. So for those who don't know me, I've been in Portsmouth for 25 years. I was curator at Strawberry Bank. I've been involved as a board member at the Portsmouth Historical Society and work professionally in museums throughout the area. So I'm delighted to see something like this be, you know, before us. And I, I certainly hope, you know, it's welcome and embraced and we think it would be a really wonderful thing, a very positive thing for our community. So happy to answer questions if people have it. Any? But it, Kate's been great to serve with as well. Yeah. I'm, in the definitions, we've got visual arts, musical arts, theater arts, cultural community events, historical preservation, education. Mm -hmm. um, should we add poetry and written word? Oh. We've got, we've got a poet huh. laureate. We've got. Uh, Hmm. We used to have poetry slams. I don't know if we have them anymore. We used That's to have William Shatner question. beat night. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Um. Performing arts. It's a very good question. I mean, so I'm wondering if that falls under theater arts in some ways, mm -hmm. um, yeah. as a form of performance art. Yeah. I mean, I we could just add performance art. Well, or you wonder if poetry is li uh, literary arts? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I would just... Literary and performance arts? Yeah, or whether there should be a general statement that would be open for arts that we haven't imagined. Because I'm sure people could say, well, I'm a video, video artist, or, right. you know, there could be other forms of art. Yeah. I mean, I think the spirit of yeah. this is to be as inclusive as possible and to recognize that we aren't going to know everything right. and yet to be able to respond to the interests of the community. Mm -hmm. I think that the term cultural community events was designed to capture um, things that you would not normally consider, like um, uh, Pro Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. Events. Right. Well, we have authors in yes. Portsmouth. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. So you could include a literary, yeah. literary and performance arts reference. Yeah. If, you, if everyone thinks that that's that's reasonable. That's quite a tradition there. Okay. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And and we don't want to be exclusive. I think we want to be supportive and inclusive. So. And I, I'm sure there are more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Or will be more. Right. So we can insert the language then, say, after theater arts, comma, literary and performance arts, mm -hmm. comma, cultural community events. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, I should note that um, arts and nonprofits in the cultural planning subcommittee do not intend for this to come back to them. So they're comfortable. Um, sending it forward, so um, and they knew that governance might make some changes. Okay. So, um, just a little logistical question at this point: Are you, are, are, are you as chair, keeping track of the changes you're going to make? Yes. Yes. Um, we can then have them typed up in the legal department. Okay. 
So this is a good kind of comment that says we haven't gone far enough. We'd like to see more. <clears throat> That's wonderful. Um, the, I think the, the key element here was defining membership mm -hmm. for the group. They wanted to make sure that they had four members from institutions, four individual artists or um, so that we didn't leave that group out and four members that were or patrons or supporters of the arts. Um, and so, so that you had a nice balance on the committee and that no one group dominated discussion. Um, that was a lot of the lesson learned um, from Artspeak. And then they made sure that there was a city council representative and uh, uh, the city manager's representative on the committee um, because they wanted that tie back so that they would always um, kind of have an idea of what um, was feasible within the city. Because um, this really sets up, it's basically, it's a committee. It's an, a commission in the same way the Economic Development um, Commission exists. So um, that is the vision here, is that it is a city committee, um, not an independent acting agency. Um, so in the way that Artspeak raised funds, this organization would not be able to. This is truly a committee of the city and yeah. should function as right. such. Because yeah. the spinoff and need to raise funds was fatal. Exactly. And so you will see that um, the powers uh, in um, at the bottom section 5, so that's C5, um, they shall identify governmental funding sources, including state and federal funding resources designated for municipalities. So that's the key language there to support its work. And that language is there to prevent this committee from competing against um, local institutions in raising funds. Um, because you don't want it competing against nonprofits. You want them to be looking for grant opportunities at the state and federal levels um, where there are grants that are specifically designated for municipalities um, for arts, arts and cultural institutions. So, yes, that's what uh, Under powers and duties, it refers to the wider Portsmouth community. Yes. And does that imply beyond Portsmouth or does that, um, I'm not sure why the wider is in there. Um, the wider is there because the Americans for the Arts study, which is conducted by arts and nonprofits, is a regional study. So even though it's Portsmouth centric and really focuses on the institutions that are in Portsmouth, um, some of the in cultural institutions that are just outside of Portsmouth boundaries participate in that and we're measured against other municipalities um, based upon a wider community set. You know, New Hampshire is really unusual in the nation um, in the sense that we have other communities that bound right up against our boundaries, um, whereas um, uh, in most um, parts of the country you have a community and you have a county and you don't have cities right up against each other. Um, so this is envisioning, you know, it's Portsmouth and Portsmouth's immediate um, cultural institutions in the surrounding area. I should note that when we do the Americans for the Arts study, we don't survey um, institutions in Kittery, for example. Okay. Um, but we, um, we, in fact, we really survey institutions in Portsmouth. But a lot of the patrons of the arts are not from Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of surveys from people who live in Kittery and Rye and Northampton. And that's the goal is to capture the fact that our arts and cultural institutions are not limited to just Portsmouth patrons, that we have an impact in this local region. And that's what the Americans for the Arts study also measures. So I think that th that's, that's the goal, is to make sure that we're not um, somehow in a situation where down the road somebody says, well, you can't, you can't do surveys of anyone who's not a Portsmouth resident, because that's not the way the Americans for the Arts study works. So, um, and that's a national level study that is done. Um, I think um, another aspect, and you I probably said it better than I am, but 
you know, the economic benefit of a vibrant arts community is not, doesn't just end at the boundaries of our town. So as a coordinating body, having awareness and being able to coordinate within arts that are happening regionally would make this, the work of this commission stronger. Yeah. I guess one of my, uh, in, in the powers and duties, it says encourage support, but later on it ta also talks about um, probably, you know, funding sources and financial support. And so I just, you know, I think there's a line there. Mm -hmm. um, nice. And I, I guess mm -hmm. I want to make sure that that's clear. Mm -hmm. right. So the funding is Portsmouth specific and so, not being used for organizations outside of the boundaries of yeah, the town. Yeah, I just think that's, I think that's, that's a fair concern. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think there are legal limitations on that when you receive funding for municipalities. So um, mm -hmm. that has to be directed toward your municipality. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not as concerned about that. Um, what I'm concerned about is putting us in a situation where we can't, um, we're not thinking about artists that have left Portsmouth and moved to Kittery or Rye or, because they could find housing. Mm -hmm. um, but no, they no, do. I, the, I understand that. Part. Yeah, yeah, they do all their work in Portsmouth. So, um, so we we need to be really mindful of you know people have a studio here, and they sell their work here, and they're you know part of say the button factory. That's where their studio operates. Like just like anyone who comes into Portsmouth and works during the day, um, that those are Portsmouth artists. And so we have to be really mindful of that because we're losing our artists um, because of housing challenges, and we have been for 20 years. In fact, that was a recommendation that came out of the first cultural plan was to look at changes um, to our zoning to encourage um, studio workspaces. Mm -hmm. That was also a recommendation that came from arts and nonprofits after the first year of their work um, uh, and pandemic recovery is that we need studio workspace like studio living workspaces that is something we still have not done to update our zoning code right. and and uh, we haven't invested specifically in artist live workspaces yeah. and so that keeps coming up and, and it's in an effort to retain um, art artists that have been here for years and yeah. years but ultimately um, have had to leave due to changes in rental pricing so so I think that that's what they're really mindful on, of. Um, we don't want to lose what they bring to the city. Um, just a couple of practical housekeeping questions. Mm -hmm. Will the number of meetings a year be set by the chairman? Uh, or is there a tempo of meetings you want to establish? Hmm. Um, that's a great question. If you if you do have a schedule, then if you need city resources or staff support, staff can predict mm -hmm. when they need to attend or what they need to do. Mm. Currently, arts and nonprofits meets monthly, but that could be defined in the ordinance. Um, you could uh, put a line here that that says the committee shall meet or. Um, the commission shall meet uh, no less than quarterly. You know, sure. So my thought would be be careful you don't limit yourself in a way you don't want to. Yes. If the commission decides it needs to meet every week, it should meet every week. Right. So if you say the commission shall meet no less than yeah, something like quarterly, that. Yep. then right. you account for maybe in the summer they decide not to meet because their four institutional members are too busy for summer and that that's something that they've encountered in the arts and nonprofits committee is that they struggle to make quorum during the busiest times of the year um, for their institutional members that's part of the reason they the membership was defined the way it is because it, when it's all institutional members they really struggle depending upon who has a busy schedule mm. at that time of year Plus that sense implies the Commission can meet as frequently as it wants which is the point I was trying to make okay so um, 
And where do you think, um, this is a question for our legal counsel, where would you insert a phrase like that in membership and term or? Um, I had thought at the very, the very final sentence of section A okay. seemed like the logical place for me. Okay. The commission shall meet no less than quarterly. Yes. Does that work for everyone? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, section A and and I would assume the schedule would be set by a chair. Mm -hmm. Right. But that mm -hmm. that would be my assumption as well. Yeah. Um, I think that um, you know they didn't mention election of chair here because that is now going forward already. Covered. It's covered in the rest of our ordinance. I should note that. The one question that the committee came to us with a real question on here was how do we address um, appointments, rotational, rotational. schedule? Now this is not envisioning that current members get reappointed. Okay, so so it's, in a, it's like almost like creating a new committee because arts and nonprofits and the cultural planning subcommittee will both sunset at the end of December. Um, so those two entities will cease to exist. This replaces them. And so. Um, so you insert terms there under the broader ordinance that we have. Right. So then the question becomes, do, do we put a line in here about um, appointments shall um, be staggered or uh, upon first appointments? That's where I've, I've asked um, legal counsel to well, give us some advice. Isn't that in our overall in the um it is not unfortunately yet so um well then put it in yeah. so we can either put it in the ordinance itself or you can put instructions at the end of the ordinance to the mayor around appointments which we've done for cemetery committee but that was mostly reappointments so then the question becomes where's the proper place and i think that um, legal counsel is probably the, this is going to need some work um okay. The sentence is, all members shall be appointed by the mayor for a term of three years. That is the language that has gotten us into problems in the past. Yes. Because the mayor makes an appointment when somebody resigns. The mayor makes an appointment when somebody leaves town. Uh, the, 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 you lose your cohesiveness. And does he and so appoint it, the remainder of a term? Right. But somebody gets three years? Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's got to say what the committee wants it to say along the lines of what Council Tabor just suggested. Right. So should it, should after that phrase, should you have the initial appointments shall be made um, for one, two, and three year terms? Sure, there are so many members. Um, to create a stagger? It, it, you could create, you could create the stagger just by saying, the initial round of appointments shall be thereafter. All appointments shall be for the remainder of any unexpired or ah. term. Okay. So you've got some. You've got a formula. Yeah. Okay. So let's here. Let's go through that language one more time so we make sure we get it correct. Well, you can decide. Uh, okay. If there's going to be 14 members, then and the mayor's going to make initial appointments. Uh, you could, in all, after the initial round of appointments, they're all going to be for three-year terms. Yes. So you say something like, depending on what you want, the mayor shall make initial appointments as follows: um, four members for this, you know, three-year terms, uh, four members for you know whatever comes out to fourteen numbers. Yeah, so a total of fourteen. So four members for yeah. two-year terms. And one, one of them is going to have five members. Yeah. Four members for one year terms. Yeah, I don't think, I think this is 14, some kind of a number that doesn't, it doesn't work. It's not going to divide into well, three. The, well, it does. It's 12. It's actually 12, then a city councilor and a, a city staff. Oh, that counts. Okay. They're part okay. of the. Okay. <laughs> so it's really 12. So it really works for four and right. four. four, four. Right. Um, so the initial appointments. Um, the mayor shall make 
the initial appointments as follows. Four members for three-year terms, four members for two-year terms, four members for one-year terms. Thereafter, all appointments shall be for three-year terms. Uh, I should say all um, full appointments. All appointments shall be for three. Be for the yeah year terms or the remaining yes that will work uh, with the remaining um what is it, the phrase the remaining unfilled portion of a term unfilled portion of a term and that allows for three year term or filling the remainder of the term yeah, i would say unfilled portion of the term first because that that needs okay. to be done first shall be or for three-year terms okay so All right. so uh, now I'm up to 13 though we've got the 12 members that just got appointed the way you just just wrote and then one city council shall serve in a term mm -hmm. corresponding with his or her term of office so that's up to 13 then the city manager or his or her their representative shall serve as an uh, ex officio yeah, member of the commission yeah. Yeah. Don't you want to make the language about filling the remainder of terms stronger or prohibitive, saying um, must fill? Yeah. That's why I wanted that first. Right. So appointments must fill uh, um, open. Yeah. Un 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 Completed incomplete terms. incomplete terms terms must be filled for the remainder of the term only or something like that is that too bright it's, it's clear enough once you, if you it's a little awkward but it's I'll, clear um, <laughs> thereafter incomplete terms must be filled for the remaining unfilled portion of a term yeah or not or um, I mean, it has to be then, once those are filled, then... Upon expiration of a term. Upon, yeah. let's be, on, upon expiration of a term, all appointments shall be for... A, three years. Be for a three-year term. Is that clear? It's clear to me that the point is you're trying to maintain this three-year stagger. Yeah. yeah. Right. So if you if you look at it that way, you'll, you'll and you might just introduce that sentence with to maintain a staggered right. membership cycle, right? To this is the process. A staggered <laughs> membership. Incomplete terms. Okay, so here's what I have. The initial the, the mayor shall make the initial appointments as follows: four members for three-year terms, four members for two-year terms, four members for one-year terms. Thereafter, to maintain a staggered membership, incomplete terms must be for the remaining unfulfilled portion of a term. Period. Upon expiration of a term, all uh, appointments shall be for a three-year term. Yeah. Is that logical to everyone? Sounds like it to me. I think it okay. got the fence around it. Okay, and so we will take the language out. All members shall be appointed by the mayor subject to, well, wait, to the, well, we can say all members shall be appointed by a mayor subject to the approval of the council, period, yes. and take out the for a term of three years and in, insert this language in there, that section. Does that make sense yeah. in section A? Yeah, I think okay. it does. And that answers the question that they came forward with, um, and they're, they'll be happy with this language. This is exactly what they were trying to achieve. They just wanted to make sure that they had the right language to do that, and they were counting on governance to do that. So thank you all. Mm -hmm. um, the only other, um, yeah, I'm ahead. not recommending this be changed, but have you considered as time moves on that you might not be able to get 12 all the time and you 
might want a range of, say, 8 to 12 or something like that. So that there's, like we found with the cemetery committee, started off at 24, but it was more practical to get a shrink it to fit the number of people who really were active. I just pose that for consideration. Yeah. Most of the artists I know shy away from bureaucracy. Um, <laughs> That's a, I think that is a mild, gentle <laughs> statement. Um, <laughs> it erodes their membership card. If <laughs> you know, um, it's interesting that the biggest challenge that we had was thinking about ways to limit the size of the committee because we've had too many volunteers, not too few. That's good. Uh, arts and nonprofits is bigger than this. Um, it's 20 on the cultural planning subcommittee. Yeah. yeah. And so it's a question of trying to limit. Mm -hmm. um, we all have to remember our arts community is very large in Portsmouth. And so um, we're going from 15 institutional members of arts and nonprofits down to four. Yeah. Um, and that's part of the reason you see the language that they can't serve consecutive terms as institutional members. Um, because the goal is to have a rotation of institutional members and not have the same four institutional members. Not just the big four. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, so that there is shared representation there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think the, the concern of the committee is not that we need an 8 to 12 range, but that 12 is pretty small. Um, they, I will tell you that when um, we went back to, to them from the task force with this language to look at, it was originally at five, five, and five. And so they took it down to four, four, and four because they were worried it was a little unwieldy. Okay. Um, so, um, and they, when we discussed it there, the discussion was, you know, you can always come back to the council and ask for changes in your ordinance in the way that the cemetery committee did and that's what I suggested to them is that let's see how it works first and then if you see immediate changes that need to be made you can come back you know within a few months even if you see problems and ask for changes but the hope is that they won't have challenges here um, I guess I have one more question yes defining institutional member what inst what I mean what defines an institution right and that's in the definition section that's why we included that definition yeah. primarily in direct community work in visual arts musical arts theater arts cultural community events and historic preservation in that language we will have to add literary and performance arts mm -hmm. in the same That's the language we had just discussed, but um, but that is the goal that they're um, in direct community work in these areas. So so you want institutions that are um, interacting with the public. Um, and I mean, part of are they by mm -hmm. definition an institution meaning a nonprofit? Um, that's the reason we use the term institution <clears throat> and not nonprofit is there were particular concerns about making sure we include for-profit institutions as well because a lot of our arts galleries are yeah. for-profit and then we have also major institutions like the press room um, and Jimmy's Jazz and Blue Club they're also for-profit entities um, in the city but are very active in performing arts in the community so you don't want to exclude them and I, that concern came from the Chamber of Commerce, that when we established arts and nonprofits initially, um, it excluded um, some of these for-profit institutions, and um, they have a huge impact um, in our community. Yeah. Okay, good. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if they'll apply or if they'll be interested, yeah, well. but, right. but we, want to, we don't want to exclude them. Yeah. That's good. Think about things like like Sirius Street Gallery mm -hmm. is another institution that's or individual artists who are entrepreneurs in exactly. their own way. Mm -hmm. 
it's hard to have a, re a requirement that you're not for profit for institutions then turn around and include artists who are not nonprofits yeah. um, on the committee. Yeah. yeah. So, are there any other questions? Sounds like it needs another run through the word processor. <laughs> Chat um, GPT or whatever. Um, I'm happy to make the changes that we've discussed. Um, I just want to make sure there aren't, if there are any others, I think it's important that we include them today. Part of the reason this committee is bringing this forward now and came straight to governance with it is they did a timeline on when they would like to have this adopted. And when you look at the timeline of the council, and you date backwards. Um, so appointments take two meetings of the council, that's December. You need at least a month prior for people to put in applications, which gets us really back to October because of the scheduling of the November meeting. Um, so then you need three readings. So then you come and you need a fourth um, council meeting to introduce it. So then um, that gets us back into August. So um, they wanted this to go to the council in August. Um, so that's the heads up I'm giving everyone. Yeah, um, and that's why they, we, we're seeing it now. Um, so um, if we have any more language changes, I'd love to get them in here so that I can bring them back to governance for the meeting on July 27th so that there's still a possibility that they can get this in. And noting that the reason they're looking at that timeline is that they're planning to sunset end of December and they want to make sure that there's a committee in place to take over the work because the cultural plan might not be finished. Yep. So they don't want to be in a situation where there's no committee. No plan. No plan. And there isn't anyone to work with our consultants yep. at that time. So. And aside from the near term, I think the sooner we get a permanent arts and cultural commission, the better. Mm -hmm. You know, just because we have not had that for what, six, eight years? Mm -hmm. Right, right, since Art Speak um, sunsetted. So I think that's the concern. So, yes, Councilor. Um, I wonder, because of this timeline mm -hmm. um, and the other business we had today, if we might. Um, you know, suspend the rules and get public comment on on this now, okay. rather than at the end of the meeting. Um, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'll take a motion to do so. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, is there anyone from the public that wants to speak to this particular um, ordinance? Mm -hmm. Please come forward. Petra Huda, 280 South Street. Um, some questions for you to think about. Um, the first thing um, down in an additional four members shall be appointed from the community of additional members. Um, recommendation here would be recommended. Um, a lot of stuff isn't defined here and basically you're having people in a committee recommend actually appoint them, that word is a little, uh, I, I would suggest recommend for appointment instead of appoint. Uh, the other thing here in, I know, I understand every, this, this should be all inclusive, everybody should be considered equally. So I wonder how you were, are going to define um, the additional four members. Um, as you just discussed, there is quite a large community here, and it was difficult to get down the institutional from, uh, you said 15, down, down. So if the greater community is even larger, um, I guess who, dis, who, who defines um, who would come forward then? Um, that's a, in my mind, that's a big question. Um, the next thing, um, I thought 
Councillor Tabor's suggestions were excellent, as you have experience with the cemetery committee, needing less. The, the question I would have there is, have you thought about or discussed when this committee is going to vote um, what amount they would need for a quorum then, depending on, on how many <coughs> participants you have at each meeting? So that would be, that would be another thing. Um, uh, and on the second page, I think uh, Councillor Lombardi addressed this, but the question in my mind on number three uh, would be create a plan for attracting and retaining artists and cultural institutions. Um, what, what does that really mean? Um, do you need a definition there of, of what that means? What, what does that plan mean and are you overlapping with the other committee that you have uh, in defining that? Um, as you discussed, uh, number five, shall identify governmental funding. Um, maybe uh, just instead of saying governmental funding, uh, since you are looking at grants, maybe put that in the, in the wording, just a suggestion. Uh, the other question I would have uh, on that number five um, is will the amount of money going in here be um, considered uh, in, I, I, know, I know we discussed the, um, when the city actually builds a certain percentage would be going to the, for, for artists and stuff like that. Is this where the committee, uh, so I, I don't know if you want to clearly define that or not. And um, I, think, I think that's all my questions. I mean, my, my big concern here, especially with the um, getting down to four members to be recommended, I guess, would be, uh, you know, who, who's going to decide that? And with a large, um, you know, pool to pick from, um, you know, please consider that, that uh, it, it's a big pool. Thank you. Hope that helps. Is there any other public comment? I don't know if there's anyone online. Can't tell. Do I qualify as public comment? Um, Have I already commented? You've already commented. Yeah. Give it a minute. We're going to go back to discussion. I'm checking online if we have anyone. I don't see anyone on Zoom. Am I wrong? I don't have the screen up. Like, I can't see the Zoom screen. Um, that's what I was looking for. No. No. Um, it's unfortunate. Um, so I can't. There are three participants. Let me double check. Why don't you? Um, I'm going to stop get, sharing stop so sharing. I can yeah. see. Nope. There's nothing on Zoom. Okay. No, um, Kevin's taking his head in. Yep. So um, I think that I'll close public comment on this issue. And is there further discussion from the committee? Um, I thought Peter made some good comments on that. Um, recommending rather than yeah. pointing. Um, I thought the same thing. Yeah, and uh, and the funding. It just says governmental funding sources, and there are other funding sources as well. Okay. Um, um, hmm. And perhaps the quorum issue too. Okay. I want to ask legal counsel about. Sure, this. I can answer the quorum question right now, uh, which is, unless the ordinance is changed to create a specific quorum, or unless the commission itself adopts a rule uh, specifying a quorum, the quorum is always going to be a majority of those present and voting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we could basically leave that to the committee to create a rule for a, a quorum. Yes, you could. And that might be a better thing to do yeah, rather uh, than... My thinking is that with, a, with such a large commi commission, uh, 
yeah. in the flexibility that you can just tell looking at it now is going to be inherent in the way this operates. That is probably the best mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way that arts and nonprofits has worked is it's half of membership um, plus one. Yeah. So, so <clears throat> I would anticipate they would expect eight eight members yeah. um, the, on this. Sure, the fallback will always be majority president voting. Yeah. That's good. Um, and I have a question specifically on recommended versus appointed. Um, I, I'm asking this question because these are really instructions for the mayor. Clearly, the mayor always makes those um, appointments and or makes a, the recommendation to the council for approval. So, um, recommended for appointment. In a very real sense, the mayor's appointment is just a recommendation to the council to vote. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, here's my concern, and here's my question. If it, you change the language of recommended for appointment to recommended for appointment, I want to make sure that we don't somehow dilute the instructions that it should be for, for, and for, and we don't get into a position where somebody decides, well, we want more in, one more institutional member and one fewer artist and one more community member and one fewer institutional members. Um, because I think this is a very delicate balance in this community, and that was part of the redux from discussing art speak, um, is creating a a really balanced committee. So um, legally, how what does that change here? Uh, I I personally think that the language as it exists now is language which is understood to mean something by members of the council. In members of the community, and it it, it it really means what former council Huda wants people to think it means. It, it does mean that, and they'll they'll follow it. Okay. 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 And then the the last question or concern around funding, um, I can answer that. Um, the reason it says governmental funding sources and not grants, um, because. You don't want to limit those funding sources. Um, say that um, you receive, uh, you know, funding from a, a Council on the Arts that isn't a grant funding. That's just, you know, they decide to to send you a check to support the the committee. You don't want to limit that. You also don't want to limit them. Um, say um, the council decides to fund provide funding. For, for them for some event, which the council has done in the past for um, the AFTA study. So you don't want them to be limited in that, that sense. Um, you want, but the, you want them to restrict them to governmental sources of funding, not seeking donations from community members, which is a direct competition with um, our nonprofit institutions. Um, and percent for the arts is very clearly designated to go to the Public Art Review Committee because it goes to the Public Art Trust. And <clears throat> they are the committee that's tasked with handling percent for arts. Right. So, and, and so that's, that's clear here in, um, in Section 6. Uh, we made sure that this commission would work in coordination with them and in support of public, the Public Art Review Committee to promote public art in the city of Portsmouth. We wanted to, to clearly make it clear that they can coordinate with public art, that they're not supplanting public art um, review because they have much more of a technical role. Um, yeah, and their duties are very clearly prescribed and even their bank account is set up and prescribed, so. Exactly, exactly. So this this serves much more like an EDC role, but for arts and cultural institutions mm -hmm. and the art, arts and culture within the community. So that I think that is the goal here. Um, does that help explain those things, or do we have further questions? I think it's okay. Okay, okay. Um, so I'll look to this committee for um, advice. Are we reasonable taking this language back and me bringing it back to the July 27th meeting of the committee for final consideration at that stage? Uh, I would support that. I, you know, I think what we would got is it's clear about the composition of the committee. It's clear about the meetings of the committee. It's clear about the deliverables from the committee and, and its purpose. So um, I think we just make those few changes about 
ensuring a staggered staggered appointments and and uh, some other wordsmithing and we're good. Okay. Okay. And I guess I would ask John um, if he feels that those changes are agreeable to the committee. I think they definitely will are agreeable to the work group. Having been a member of that, and we, you know, met several times to discuss this. What you're proposing, I don't think, affects the nature of or the focus of the commission at all. I mean, one one question I have, and I, you know, this could be a sidebar. I guess the commission doesn't exist, and the scope of work is going to be determined by the membership of the commission. So I imagine it's possible that there may be issues that will emerge that would warrant an amendment to this ordinance. So I wonder how difficult that is or if it's naive to think you can begin and know that you're going to have to modify. Th no, I think we, we assume that with all okay. ordinances at yeah. some point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. because I think once the commission gets started, I think the nature of the work and their cycle of responsibilities will take form, and I think that's going to do a lot to drive this forward. Mm -hmm. And you may have programs of work referred to you by the council, too. Yeah, that's right. So. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? It's all a work in progress. <laughs> it's all prologue, right? <laughs> Spoken like a true artist. <laughs> All right, then um, if there are no further questions, um, we will make the requested changes, bring it back to the next governance committee meeting in final form. Um, with those changes, you'll see them blue lined in the next version, so it's really clear. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully then this committee can move this forward for August for the council. Okay, I think John made a motion for that, and I'll second it. Uh, yeah, I'll move it. Move that we uh, refer it back to the committee and uh, with the goal of uh, returning to the council in um, maybe not include that. Um, I, I should tell you that the committee doesn't expect to see it again. They don't want to see it again. They don't have time to see it and they don't meet until the end of August. Okay. So, so they're not expecting to see it. They just want it to, to, to go, go it from governance on. So I would move that we uh, uh, present the amended Arts and Cultural Commission ordinance as amended today to the council. Second. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Is everyone comfortable with that? Because um, I can always bring it back with change, changes. Or are we just comfortable making the amendments and presenting it? I am, I think. Yeah. I think we talked about it. It's all on the record. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. I will make the uh, changes that we discussed and move it forward to the council with the EDC um, ordinance as well. Great. Thank, Thank you so much yeah. for joining us today. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Bob. I know you have to go. Yeah, as noted, I have to go to the manager's office. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, it was a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the Sustainability Blue, Ribb Blue Ribbon Committee Conversion Ordinance. I'm just giving a status update. Um, the committee discussed it at their June meeting, and um, they were posed several questions around membership and definitions of terms. They anticipating discussing it. They anticipate discussing those and coming back to this committee after their meeting next week. So we will see those at our first meeting in August, I anticipate. So that's when Governance Committee will be taking up those final changes from sustainability. Um, I thought everyone should be aware of the status on that one. And if everyone will remember here, that one was very close to being completed. We just had some questions around um, membership and the way they wanted to uh, define that in terms for individuals and how they wanted to stagger individual terms. Um, so uh, the next item on our agenda is this conflict of interest um, in the administrative ordinance that sections 1801, 1802. This is the final draft language that we have been discussing for a few months. Um, here I will now pull up that language to look at. Um, 
we received a memo from legal counsel and this was included in the packet as well um, and it describes the changes that were made in formatting which you'll see here in the draft language um, most specifically the indent was fixed that there was a concern around that um, and making sure that that was really clear um, does anyone have any qu questions about these final draft language changes and I'll go really quickly for everyone at home I'll make sure we go through these there was a correction in formatting error um, there were modifications to 180d 1802d that we discussed at the last governance committee meeting and there was rewording in section 1802jc that was also discussed at the june 26th meeting so 1802d Here's that language. And that was referring everyone to what you'll see in 1901 and 1902, which we're going to start discussing um, in a few minutes, really briefly, and today. And then there's also uh, the language in J. Here, um, right. which we discussed at length mm -hmm. at our last meeting. I'm just thinking ahead to when this does go to the council. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been a long process for us, so to bring everyone else up to speed, would it make sense to have a work session before our regular meeting? Maybe it's a half an hour work session or a 45 minute work session. Um, so that there's time for discussion. We can put it on a council agenda as to bring forward with first for forced reading with a work session. Okay. I think that's fair. I don't know if that's the right way to go or not. I'm just, it occurs to me that. I think you know the amount of discussion we've had um, this has been reviewed a lot but not with the whole council okay and um, yeah I think that's a reasonable request up to the chairman I mm -hmm. think. um I think it's entirely reasonable to introduce it that way to the council um, because I think that it is going to be um, while I don't feel like the changes are as significant as um, um, as some would say there are some uh, important changes that have been made that the council may have uh, a lot of questions around. Um, and we can have, I think it's important for the council to have that discussion. How do we want to bring this forward? How do we want to um, to address this? So a work session would be great. I, I don't want to add to anyone's calendar if, if that is not the will of the entire council, but it, I think giving them the opportunity to have that discussion and, and bringing it, raising it um, would be helpful. Yeah, you yes. could, you could fashion it as a move to hold a work session or in the alternative to bring forward to first reading. So if they read it <laughs> and say, oh, well, this seems pretty clear to us, they could move it forward in the usual course. But as you say, if they think there's value in a work session, then it's kind of teed up and that way before we hold first reading, if there are suggestions that would, they would like to make to the what you're bringing forward, we'll get those suggestions early in the process before it goes to first reading and second, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So give them the option. Give them the option. Yeah, because I think the three of us are probably writing for first reading, having been through it. Right. But it, you never know what the response is going to be 
from the other six members of council um, for something that's um, a change to this to this section and I wouldn't want anyone to be confused by it so I think that is a very nice suggestion yeah I'm just thinking of you know we've had to learn about the difference between legislative and quasi judicial we've had to learn and wrestle with just the officer or elected official or family you know uh, what's the difference between a real conflict and a, the appearance of a conflict um, you know those are all the, the grounds that we've covered mm -hmm. well I guess uh, if we have a first reading um, Then there's, you know, and maybe, I don't know, somehow put with that um, a presentation um, that might be, can you do that as, as a first reading? Um, yes, we sometimes do presentations at first reading rather than second. It, mm -hmm. We have flexibility that way if that's something that rather, was desired. Rather than, you know having a separate you know work session I guess is what I'm saying that's an that's another option mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would be happy to talk with the um, city manager about asking staff to to do that mm -hmm. um, and having a presentation it would be from our legal department I'm sure on this issue right mm -hmm. and this is the companion piece to the changes we made in the ethics committee and its process so correct you know there's context to give it yes and also um, we anticipate as you will see on the agenda today that that we will be working on a preliminary draft ethics policy that would also come forward um, later to address anything that is not not legal in nature so it would not be included in the ordinance but it is um, recommended um, recommended um, ethical behavior mm -hmm. which we've discussed prior so so um, so that it might be important for us to, to also explain that to the council is where well that there are a lot of things that um, we consider unethical as far as behavior goes but they're not legally unethical and that's why they're not in the ordinance um, that the, there are certain legal requirements around ethics versus um, what we think of in our day-to-day -day practice as being ethical or unethical in nature so so explaining that difference I think would also be very helpful which is this committee has benefited from that in ways that the general the the council as a whole has not heard I think mm -hmm. that discussion I think legal can provide right. some real insights there right. for the council um, so what is the the will do you want to still have uh, Councilor Tabor have a motion to to bring this forward with a work session or would you prefer a presentation or how, how do we want um, to address this I, I think I think the presentation approach maybe streamlines it mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I would do uh, do we all think this is ready to move forward I think mm -hmm. would be the next question mm -hmm. I guess there's only one way to find yeah uh, <laughs> you know? uh, I mean I think I think that our review has been thorough it's been public right um. okay mm -hmm. 
Uh, we've worked on this for some time. We've taken a lot of public comment as well during that time frame on the, this issue. So we've had an opportunity to for the public to weigh in. We've had a guest speaker come in and address this to start our discussion on this. We will still be working on some of those suggestions that came from our guest speaker in 1901 and 1902 and also a council policy, um, things like uh, disclosures online. You know, that would be more of a policy of the council and not in the ordinance. Um, so a lot of this is, um, this is what, I, I feel like at this stage, this is probably what we could put in the ordinance in this part of the ordinance. Um, some of those requests and changes will come in our further discussion in 1901 and 1902, which is on exact, on disclosures themselves um, and how we disclose information and making sure that we are including, including everything in that information that that's requested as well, so. Okay, so I would move that we, um, move this forward from committee to the council with a presentation. Okay. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. This will move forward then to the council with a presentation. Um, we have not requested public comment specifically on this because we did not make any changes this this week. We had public comment uh, in June on June 26 on these exact um, changes. So nothing has changed since we had la our last public comment. So I should note that that's why we didn't invite public comment here again on this. Um, so going back to our agenda for the day. Um, Election disclosures is the next topic. Um, I don't want to keep everyone too long today, so um, we're going to start our initial discussion on election disclosures. That's Administrative Ordinance 1902, um, and it's reflected in the city charter as well. Um, we're not discussing the city charter um, at the moment because we are too late to discuss changes to the city charter for the um, election, a coming election. So these would not be reflected in or recommended in the city charter. So this is section 1902, election candidate financial disclosure section. And I wanted just to, for us as a committee to start going through this kind of line by line and also discussing anything that is not included here or um, changes that you would like to see um, potentially on election disclosures. I should note, and I think that this is really important, and I included this in the agenda, that there are two things to discuss here. Current election disclosure requirements, right? So what does the form look like right now for election disclosures? Um, what should it look like? What should we make sure it has on it? And that's in compliance with the current ordinance, the way it is written now. And then discussion of any proposed changes to the ordinance, and that would be separate because those changes to the ordinance would not impact the upcoming election. They would first be in place for the 2025 municipal election. So I think that that's really important. None of the changes that we would be looking at today would impact the upcoming election because it's just too late in right. the year to do that. Um, but we can impact the uh, disclosure requirements by making sure that they're adequately reflected in the forms um, that candidates have to submit. So we can make that request of the clerk that requirements that are currently in 192 are fully reflected. Um, would that be something we as governance would recommend to the council and then to the clerk? Wouldn't that be the? I think the recommendation would go to the, through the city manager to the clerk. Um, and they would not have to go to the council um, because it is currently in ordinance already. So it's, um, for example, in section 1902B, the report of expenditures shall specify the cumulative total but need not be itemized. Currently, the disclosure form does not ask for the cumulative total, even though that is currently in our ordinance. Right. Um, 
and shall be required only if the candidates or political action committee's expenditures since the last municipal election equal or exceed a cumulative total of $100. So um, currently, Section B is not reflected in the form right. that we submit okay. as counselors. So the question I have for this committee is whether or not um, we approach the city manager and say, hey, we need to make sure the form reflects the ordinance, and it doesn't currently, um, specifically requiring a cumulative total of expenditures for the election. Now, we have candidates that do disclose that anyway because it's in the ordinance. But when the form doesn't request that, um, unfortunately, most individuals running, especially people who are new to the process, wouldn't realize that they weren't disclosing um, something that is requested in an ordinance so or required in ordinance, is what I should say. Right. So um, there is that. Um, report of monetary contributions, um, each contributor of $100 or more. I think that is what is currently requested on the form. So the form is accurate there. Um, the city clerk does a very, very good job of making sure that the requirements are met as seven days prior to an election and seven days um, the final report coming two weeks, no later than two weeks following the election. I should note, I think it's really important um, that there are provisions for violations here. Um, and that violation goes to the Code of Ethics that we've already worked on. I find it, it interesting that, um, so the referral is to the Code of Ethics but the code of ethics only applies to officers of that right. what do you are do part with of the a, committee. What do you do with a political action committee? Right. A political action committee. So these are the kind of the questions I have. What do you do with a political action committee? What do you do with somebody who commits a, a violation who doesn't get elected? Yeah. You know, can you then bar them from running for again, again? Or can you, you know, what are the... What are the violations for those who don't fall within uh, the code of ethics? So that's something that we should probably consider here for changes for 2025. <laughs> um, and it notes that the city clerk prepares those forms. Right. And that they're public record. Um, this is also this issue of public record. They are public record. We should make sure, um, as one of the requests was made, that they were made available online. That can mm -hmm. go within the city council policy. Mm -hmm. um, this does not speci specify format, um, but in a policy you could specify that. Um, so you can already see the deficiencies here yeah. as far as um, which is the second part of that consideration. What do we need to add for 2025? Um, it's clear that Section B probably needs to be reflected, I think, in the forums. I, w I would love to hear from both of you on that because I, I don't feel that, that that is really clear in our current form. Yeah. And I think our current form is pretty much the state's That's right. RSA recommended mm -hmm. form. Mm -hmm. Um, but our ordinance asks for more than that. Council Lombardi, or do you have the same sense? Yeah, I think that it is the state. So I, mm -hmm. Well, I can't mm -hmm. say that specifically, but I, that's my understanding of it. Um, would everyone here be comfortable with um, me discussing this um, with the city manager? I'd love to have a recommendation of the, out of this committee to um, discuss with the city manager so to make sure that our form reflects the current ordinance um, requirements, which are really sections B and C. Yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I, I also, we may want to have uh, 
you know, under an update under your name to the council. Okay. That we're looking at this, just so that it's public to as public as possible. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're approaching that filing period, so we want to make sure that everybody understands. Um, I think it's clear in our ordinance, so we're not changing the ordinance for the upcoming election period, but it's... Um, it's getting the disclosure to match the ordinance. Exactly. So that everybody is aware that that's coming. Right. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, and if everyone's comfortable, then I will reach out to the city manager. Um, while the city clerk um, prepares all the forms, I should note that the, technically the city clerk works for the city manager. So that's why um, we always yeah. discuss this with the city manager first. It's the city manager's job then to discuss it with the clerk. Always. Yes. Well, as long as we've got this in discussion, uh, you know, what, what tugs at me is, is the question you raised of these are all enforcement is governed by the municipal code of ethics but as you say what happens if a political action committee is formed and doesn't report their donors what happens if a candidate you know has a large donor not that goes unreported but doesn't win uh, i don't know i'd be interested in Any opinion from our legal department on that? We may have even had situations like that in the past. Mm. I know we've had situations where a group has is thought to be a political action committee, mm -hmm. and that gets contested in the public, um, in the town square, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's. When you dig into this, you run into that issue. Mm -hmm. Is it, if, right now, I'm not sure how there could be any finding of a violation or any enforcement mm -hmm. for those situations. Am I wrong on that? I don't think so, but it's been a long time since I looked at this section. <laughs> this may be more Bob's. So. Yeah, but it, it it deserves a fresh look because based on the plain reading here in front of me, I would concur with you mm -hmm. without knowing. I know there are a whole bunch of laws at the state level with which I am not familiar, so there may be some remedies True. Yeah. at the state level, and, and maybe they come into play. So I think you need a piece on that okay so we can do that but that was my hesitation so yeah I agree no, with I, the plain reading I, I think there may be some levers at, at the state level right it's just mm -hmm. a question we've encountered in discussion today yes you know, mm -hmm. so. well and I think it's important to uh, codify the requirements at the state level in our ordinance so that it's really clear to everyone who's running um, this might be their first interaction with our ordinances, really, for reviewing our ordinances because they've decided to run for office. So um, I think it's really important that it's very, very clear even what state law says on, on these requirements. Um, from my reading, there's not a lot in the RSAs. Um, so Perhaps by design. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So it's really important that, that it's very, very clear, I think. Um, I have other questions I want the committee to look at as well um, around disclosures and gifts. What do we do with in-kind gifts mm -hmm. um, during an election? Say, for example, somebody who prints signs and puts signs up for you around town if you're running for office. Those aren't your signs. You didn't buy them. You didn't spend the money for them, but it is a contribution, a campaign contribution. Um, should we have individuals declare those campaign 
campaign contributions, even if you don't know the, the dollar figure. I received approximately 10 signs that were placed on my behalf, you know, um, from an, it can even be from an unknown donor. Right. Um, but, but on the same token, if you, if you didn't ask for them, I mean, you have no control over that. But you could also have a candidate, though, that is entirely funded by an outside source and that there's no familiarity with who the outside source is. But somebody could come in and, and bankroll a campaign to the tune of two or $3,000, putting signs all over town for them. And then that candidate wouldn't have to declare that they received that donation, even though it was a significant donation. I think that's something that we should think about and talk about. Mm -hmm. I think we should also talk a little bit about the $100 limit um, for declarations because um, we should talk some about the spirit of the charter versus application when individuals ask for $99 donations so that they don't have to disclose their donors. You know, and it'd be different if our elections cost $50,000 but you can run a reasonable campaign in Portsmouth for somewhere between $1,500 and $2,000 and get elected to office. In that case, a $99 donation could be one of 15 mm -hmm. donations. So that could be pretty significant. So does that fit with the spirit of the charter on disclosures or not would be my question. Um, and I think that that's something that we should wrestle with here. I also would like to caution that this is a, a, a tight community. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's um, a community of friends mm -hmm. as well. Um, I wouldn't want to... I don't know. I, I'm, tr I'm trying to think of along those lines. You know, there's just um, I'm not sure what I'm trying to say, but I, I I like to believe that it's basically, you know, a friendly election. Mm -hmm. um, it might be contentious, but. Um, on issues, but I don't know. I, I'm just mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure that out. You know. Yeah, you don't over, want to have kind of over um, regulate it. It just seems right. Yeah, right. And I think if you're Uh, your example of somebody coming in and spending thousands of dollars to support a candidate, um, whether they ask for it or not, is an interesting one because it seems like the public should know that, mm -hmm. but it seems like the person doing that might also say, this is my right of free speech. Mm -hmm. That's where I was going to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And it may be their right of free speech, but it's important to note that if they're putting up, for example, signs around town, that's part of our election um, process and requirements around election process. And right. those are a donation. Or they're a super PAC that they haven't declared themselves a PAC. Right. Well, I think they have that's to raise money to be a super PAC. Right. Exactly. So if they're not Just raising money. Spending it is. Right. More. Right. And I have to say, in the world of social media, what if someone is posting a lot of favorable comments on social media? We're unfavorable. I think we're, well, we're concerned about the favorable yeah. to yeah. The, the donation. But when you think of the value, those social media posts are valuable. And yet it hits right at that First, that first Amendment free speech. I'm not sure. As long as right. it's your own speech and... Right. You can't limit speech, but you direct endorsements of 
candidates that cost money, for example, signs, flyers, uh, door tags, things that are directly, uh, that someone expends funds on. I think that there are some ethical questions there because it has been done. So this was pointed out to me by legal that in the past some candidates have received in-kind donations of things like signs all yeah, over town. And, and some of that has been by um, the, the two political parties right? and their organizations. Right. And so it would be really important to make sure that that um, and we have we have ordinances around signs being placed around town. So um, signs are regulated. So I think that that's important to also remember. You know, so things that cost money that if the candidate is not doing them is do you require anybody who puts up a sign to be declared a political action committee? and that they have to declare their expenses as such. You know, how do you address that? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important that, like, while we, we want to be, be in, in the spirit of wanting to be a friendly community, that it's really clear how candidates' elections are funded, even if they're funded with support from a political action committee or in-kind do donations so that we don't have accusations and lingering questions around funding mm -hmm. as well. I think that that's really important because um, accusations that, in, that are not true in some cases, in some cases they may be true, um, also taint the process. So anything that you can make do to make the the process as above board as possible um, allows us to continue to have that friendly, cordial community that that we already have. I think of Jim Splain mm -hmm. and his handmade signs that mm -hmm. I think kids made and you know he made and his supporters made. You know, mm -hmm. um, I mean they were great. Mm -hmm. um, I always like to see them. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure many of them were donated, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But um, on the same token, that's you know, that's an example of just real good stuff, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah, and in that case, you would declare in-kind donation of twenty signs from various members of the you know, members of the public, of my supporters, rather than, but rather than, you know, you placing a monetary value on that, because there probably wouldn't be a monetary value that was really clear. Um, so that's what I'm, that's where my question lies. It's the, you know, if you ask for declaration, you have to ask it for everyone, right? If you ask for that, um, but, you also want to be clear that people don't suspect that somebody is going out and spending twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars on signs for you, and putting them all over town. So, um, so in some ways, it's a way to also head off that suspicion, which in many cases is untrue. So, yeah, I think you. I mean, the spirit of our elections is that they're open to all, right? It takes five dollars to file, mm -hmm. or fifty names. Um, that it's nonpartisan, mm -hmm. and um, and that we disclose who we get money from and what we spend it on. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty good start. Uh, I think it's fair to say that third-party money that gets into the thousands 
it, it, it's not that that can't happen, mm -hmm. just that it needs to be transparent. The voters and the community needs to see who that is mm -hmm. um, and make their own judgment about that. Mm -hmm. If it comes from a political party, if it comes from a, a PAC, if it comes from, you know, a private interest, um, that needs to be transparent so that citizens can judge for themselves. Um, but we have the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just looking to see if I could find how other communities might be mm -hmm. wrestling with this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's a great thing that you can run a campaign for $1,500. Because mm -hmm. that's $1,500 $1 donors. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that allows pretty much anyone to run for school board or city council or police mm -hmm. commission or fire commission. Um, and that's the way it should be, you know. Mm -hmm. I guess I question even, you know, changing it. I mean, I frankly don't see anything wrong with the $99 donation um, because because of that. It allows people to support you without, you know, it's, um, I don't know. People want to support you, and they want to, they want to give to you. Um, and they don't, I don't know. I, they, well, I think also if you're a candidate who says, I'm not taking more than $99 because, you know, I don't want to be out uh, raising $1,000 donations. It's not yeah. what this is about. Um, mm -hmm. But like, you know, I I kind of pretty much self-funded, and then, but you know, I did get some donations. But um, you know, not everybody can self-fund. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so I guess that you know, it's nice to have a, a level in which. Anybody can participate without feeling exposed, I guess is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. It, it's, a, it's a funny question. Mm. Yeah, my question is really um, $99 is a pretty significant donation in a, a race that may only cost around $1,500. Um, is that threshold too high? Should it be lower? $50. Should it be $50? Um, if you really want every donation to be disclosed so you know who's donating money, do you want it even lower than that? Do you want it to be $25? You know, any donation over $25? So that's real my, really my question, is how much transparency do you want? Um, because uh, someone could run a pretty nice campaign with thirty ninety nine dollar donors and avoid disclosing anything about where they got their funds. So um, true, but how much are you? How much big money is ninety nine dollars that's going to affect how you act as a counselor? You know, I guess a lot of my donors were my my brother and my yeah, nephews. Right, yeah, yeah, right. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on depends on, on the counselor, right? If you're a person who cannot self fund, that ninety nine dollar donation might be really important. Yeah. So that's right. Yeah, we have to think about everyone and how yeah, that. That was my point. Is that you know I think 
Yeah, make it accessible and yeah. easy to do. Mm -hmm. No, it's not easy to go out there and ask money, ask for money too. I mean, that, to get, you know, twenty hundred dollar donations, you know. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> yeah. So I'll I'll just, you know, whichever way you guys want to go. But there is another perspective, which. If you are someone, for example, who works in government, you actually, because you strive very hard to maintain neutrality and, and want everyone who walks into your office to feel like they will be heard regardless of any political position, it does mean that some people who serve in government never donate to political candidates because of the required disclosure so that one does not appear, no matter how strongly one might have views mm -hmm. um, and support candidates, one just does not give so as to really not be on record of holding a particular view which would in any way, you know, I know that I can maintain neutrality, but because of the appearance of it. So it's, it's interesting because I see it from that other perspective of, you know, it does, it, transparency can have a chilling effect for some people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, not because we want to buy a vote, but simply because of the nature, if you sit, if you sit as a judge or, you know, like there are, you know, people who, who really um, have that, you know, it's important for them to maintain that sense of anyone can walk into my office or in my courtroom and it doesn't matter what their political views are, that they will be heard fairly and impartially. And, and so it does create a, a rub. I mean, I get the value of transparency. Um, so it's not to suggest anything. It's just interesting because there is that bit of a, a dilemma there. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and that's really my question is, is that you could have an organization in town that really wanted a certain candidate to come forward to change certain rules or ordinances within the city. And so that organization got together and everybody donated $99 to bankroll this candidate. And so the candidate could be fully funded by one entity in town, individuals that are members of one entity with a specific goal to change something at the city. Um, with $99 donations by individuals, even if that entity only had 15 members. Um, but the goal was to get something specifically changed at City Hall, and nobody would know that except the candidate and the members of that private entity, right? Um, because it wasn't disclosed. So that's my concern. That's where I'm I am on this is it just seems like ninety nine dollars is a lot of money in elections that don't cost that much money. Um, but you know, I guess my feeling about that is if I had um, the developer and all his staff um, give me uh, ninety nine dollars. Um, <laughs> I'd run like hell, you know. I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. if that gets out, you're dead. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but you know, so I, I don't know. I, again, I don't think this community works that way. Um, and I'm sympathetic to the, um, what the deputy city manager is saying. You know, somebody who's active in the PTA and needs to be seen as there for all the parents you know all of a sudden you're seen as partisan or um, or a judge or an attorney in town um, so um, you know those people may want to donate but uh, you know, if we make it too stringent, those don donations may not be there. I'm I'm not 
I've never been too troubled about ninety-nine dollars, hmm. and I've used that myself. But uh, you know, no, I haven't I, either. Hmm. <clears throat> um, but it's an interesting question. Could could some uh, business or interested organization bundle it all? Mm -hmm. Bundle a bunch of 99s. We've never seen that. We don't think we've seen that. We don't know if we've seen it. Yeah, I mean, I just... Um, uh, it seems to me in a, a, lo a local election is so proximate. It's not like a national election where you're being asked to bundle money. But a local election, it, wouldn't that wouldn't the employees say that's not for you to decide I don't know mm. I don't uh, know your either point, your I know points well taken that we don't know if it's ever happened <clears throat> we don't know and politics is changing so um, you know this ordinance has to has to take us through the next <laughs> 20 well, years whatever wildness yeah. happens yeah so so that's my you know that's my question is, is is it the right are we in the right place um or not and i'm not sure that that we are personally but that's my personal view of course i would ask everyone to disclose everything um but i always err on the side of absolute transparency and if somebody didn't want their name out in public that they supported you then they wouldn't donate to you I don't think that it would have such a chilling effect that no one would donate. Um, yeah. But I think that that's, you know, that's where I fall. Um, but I realize that there are, are challenges that create some challenges for some individuals. So I think everybody has a different, you know, threshold that they're comfortable with. So um, I, I wanted to preview this discussion today. Um, we don't have a lot of time left. so. Um, I was going to ask the committee to come back with specific suggestions at our next committee meeting um, of anything that we want to change. And I will go ahead and have that conversation with the city manager about the disclosure forms for this year to make sure they're compliant with the current um, ordinance. And then we can, if you have any concerns or recommendations, please go through this and wordsmith it. Make sure it reflects what you think we need for 2025 and beyond. And, and come back to our next meeting to discuss that. Um, and I'm sure the, the legal department will know some of our initial discussions here and, and can start working on some of those questions around outside entities. Um, but the reason I'm cutting this off is I wanna make sure that I introduce the, con the next topic, which is under new business. And that is the city council preliminary draft ethics policy, which we discussed starting at our last um, committee meeting. Um, I also want to ask the committee to send me um, any suggestions you have uh, for items that should be included in a preliminary draft ethics policy so that we can start with some language for our next committee meeting as well. So these are the two topics really that we're carrying forward to our next committee meeting. Um, so we're gonna have a much more robust discussion on both at the next committee meeting. Um, and I'd like to have some language that we can start with and then we can go through for that. Um, and I wanna make sure we have time here for a public comment as well. Are there any questions about a draft ethics policy now or do we wanna just hold off until our next meeting and where we have some draft language. Uh, you can't send those directly to me, by the way. They have to go through, uh, they can go to um, our deputy city manager. Copy Cynthia. And copy, yeah, Cynthia Revelle in legal. Um, if they'll have to compile it. Um, does that work for everyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Are there any other questions about that schedule? Okay. And when we finish 1902, we'll go back to 1901. I thought it was important to discuss 
kind of in order of appearance, elections first and then disclosures once you're elected. That made sense to me, okay. logical sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, I want to open us up to public comment, if everyone's... Petruhuda, 280 South Street. So first I want to address your denial for me to speak. Councilor Cook, I'm sorry I did not make your 626 meeting. I was out of the country. And to be denied the ability to speak because I couldn't be here is very disturbing. But I'm going to give you a heads up as to if this goes to the council, I do have some things that you do need to consider. The first one, and this is under conflict of interest, um, number 1802, um, number A. Number A says um, direct interest and indirect. That is in a conflict with council rule number 21, which only says direct. So you might want to look at that. The next thing I would ask that you look at, and to me, this is a little, a little overboard, I guess I would say, because I don't even think we require this of our employees. In number J, number A, you are asking volunteers who bring their craft and their education and their experience to be in compliance with all statutes, all statutes, and governing case law. Now, I would ask even our deputy city manager, when you come in, are you expected to know all statutes and all case law, even as an attorney? We are having a hard time getting people currently to serve on our boards. And to put more restrictions, especially this one on there, is very concerning moving forward. The next thing I will bring forward to the council in your work session is in B. And there's a word in B, C, and D that are too encompassing and too broad. And that word is any. Avoiding any involvement in the application when a family member is participating in any way, in connection. And the question is, who judges this? Same thing with number C, pending before any public body. In C, in D, the party in any litigation. This is way broad, and personally, I think it needs to be redefined. And since I didn't get the opportunity to discuss that and give it to you before you voted, I will move it forward to the council. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone on Zoom? And no more public comment? Okay. Um, then I will go ahead and close our public comment section. Um, announcements for the committee for the next meeting. Um, sorry, I kept saying July 27th. Actually, July 31st is the schedule for our next meeting. Um, again, we will be covering section 1902 first and then coming back to 1901. That's when we will get to Council Rule 21 if we have any changes on Council Rule 21, um, discuss election and, uh, and interest disclosure forms. Those are go with sections 901 and 902. Um, and um, I'm going to ask that we start talking about a sidewalk policy because some concern, the council referred that to us a while ago and um, there have been some concerns expressed lately from the public on the sidewalk policy. So I want to make sure that that does come forward here so that we have a forum for the public to come in and discuss concerns around sidewalk policy. Um, are, is there anything else that we need to cover or any more announcements? And that's a sidewalk policy, brick versus concrete, correct? Yes, it's our current mm -hmm. city council sidewalk policy. Okay. I'll see if someone from public works can attend the july 31st relative to that yeah okay um, or if not weigh in 
I'm actually on vacation that week, so I'll see who can cover. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, any other concerns? Then I'll take a motion for adjournment. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.